Welcome back to another episode of The Morning Buzz. Hi, I'm your host, Russell Gahagan from Russell's Fishing Tech. And today, pretty excited. We got uh, we got a, a new guest, somebody we haven't had before, Captain Adam Knudsen from Real to Real Outdoors. And one of the reasons I'm excited to have Adam is not only have I met him on the tournament scene over in Michigan, uh, on the Michigan side of Lake Michigan, but also he's an up-and-coming YouTuber, um, which I, I find really exciting. As a lot of you know, I was one of the one of the first uh, to sort of bring salmon fishing uh, instructional stuff and information to YouTube. And, and Adam is now uh, is adding a lot of fun and popularity to that on the Michigan side. How are you today, Adam? I'm doing well. Nice to, nice to see you, Russell. Yeah, good to see you as well. Um, why don't you start off by kind of giving everybody at home a little rundown of, you know, who you are, uh, what you do. Obviously, you have a charter boat in Ludington, Michigan. I just mentioned that you have... Uh, uh, YouTube channel, kind of talk a little bit about, you know, how you fit in the fishing industry and sort of how that YouTube channel is. All right. You know, um, so I've been, uh, I, I was one of the guys that didn't really get into salmon fishing until later in life. I, a pretty avid fisherman my whole life, but um, my, my dad didn't really salmon fish. And, and then um, when I was in, oh, probably high school going into college, one of my friends, his dad bought Captain Chucks, and this is, in you know, Captain Chucks in Ludington, uh, Michigan, and and this is way before Captain Chucks that it is now. This is several owners ago, and so we started salmon fishing, and I just got addicted to it. And uh, it's one of those things once you uh, get into it, start to understand and, and try to to um, you know really be in depth in, in the fishing. Uh, it, it's a it's a real commitment to to stay on top of things. So that kind of got me into it. Now I've worked my whole life. I've worked as a uh, production person, uh, sound, audio, lighting, video um, for live productions, and that's actually what I do for my normal job. So when COVID happened, I thought, well, maybe I should start a YouTube channel because I've been wanting to do it and wanting to. Uh, get some stuff going. We started a podcast, did some podcasting for a little while. And then I kind of transitioned to the video side of things. So it's been a, it's been a fun, um, last couple of years. Um, you know, this is probably like a good thing of, from COVID is that, uh, I had time to start this and, and, uh, kind of get involved in the, uh, in the world of, uh, YouTubing. Um, you know, there's not, there's getting to be more and more, but there's not, I would say a lot of, salmon information um i think when i started salmon fishing i had some amazing mentors um you know uh doug straczynski from polecat and uh george freeman from freestyle and greg mcgee from blue fairways and and those guys were like my go-to's and i could ask them questions and they would tell me you know this is how you do that or this is you know my take on this and most people don't have that option and or that um that luxury i guess and i was really lucky and i just thought you know it'd be really nice if there was like a youtube database of how to's and maybe like more in depth of why and and um how people take different approaches to things you know i know that the way that you fish and the way that i fish are probably very different in in many ways but similar in others and uh we we're both successful in fishing. So I don't think there's like one way to do it. And I would just, you know, I try to let people know that, you know, there's lots of different ways to be successful fishing. It's just uh, putting the bits and pieces together that work for you to, you know, make an entire program work or, or, you know, a deep water trout fishing or, you know, salmon fishing in the spring, whatever it is, there's lots of different approaches to it and, and all can be successful, but it's like the little details I think are what people miss. And, so we do a lot of talking about that, especially with the Captain's Roundtable series that we do. Um, yeah, well, you bring up a great point, and it's something that I really push hard in my salmon schools, which is I use the old school term, you know, there's many ways to skin a cat. Um, and when I give a six-hour salmon school presentation, you know, I'll tell them there's three or four things here that I believe there's only one way to do it. Now, there's not, that's not necessarily true, but in my opinion, 
you know, this Mm -hmm. is a tried and tested thing that I feel really works better than others. On the other hand, the other five hours and 45 minutes, um, you know, there's multiple ways to do this. Uh, And, you know, just kind of to bring up something I was conversating about with a couple of buddies the other day, I I went to Lake Ontario last May, and I'm going to go back this May and fish the whole month of May with um, 30 goose sport fishing. And out there, the bulk of the charter captains run one big planer board on a side with one copper off each side. And that's it. Um, you know, that's, that's how they board fish. Now, it would be very odd for you. It would be very odd for me as um, I know I can speak for myself and say that I'm a, a pretty big planer board fisherman in the sense that I like to run a minimum of six at a time most of the time, you know, with a, a either pump handles or, or coppers or whatever. Um, but, but there's a prime example. Those guys are super successful in catching king salmon out there. It's a little bit different fishery, um, and that's why they can get away with, uh, running a planer board aside with only one copper aside or whatever, um, it still have fantastic success. So you're 100% accurate, and it's why I, you know, always tell people, anybody I run into, whether they're from Wisconsin, Michigan, New York, whatever, grab as much information from everybody as you can and try it, put it together to build your own unique program that works for you. And it, it, that might involve using some Russell's Fishing Tech stuff, some Real to real stuff, some tangled tackle stuff, some you know, um, Bill from out in Lake Ontario. Um, you know, it might it might be taking a bunch of these pieces all over, and a lot of it has to do with where you fish. Because obviously, I don't know if you've had the opportunity to fish on the Wisconsin side much, but the Michigan side is quite a bit different. Yeah, there's you know, I I generally fish um, the Michigan side, and and I try to fish the entire Michigan side, um, but I don't. Uh, I'm very busy in the spring, so I don't do a lot of fishing until after Labor Day. So that kind of eliminates a lot of that, um, you know, southern end of the of the lake. I haven't made it to Wisconsin yet, and I'd love to get over there and fish. And I've had a bunch of people invite me, and I just my schedule is very busy um, during the season. So we run a lot of charters and and fish a lot of tournaments, and uh, so hopefully, but um, everywhere I I do find that everywhere you go you see different things, you see different tactics, um, you see different approaches to fishing. Um, in Ludington, we have structure, you know, we have these huge drop-offs and ledges and we fish those. And a lot of places it's just big sand flat over, um, you know, Southern Michigan, uh, Grand Haven, Muskegon, Salt Haven. I mean, there's not a lot of uh, contour changes. And so they approach, you know, fishing like the edges of water seams and and color changes and all of that stuff. So it's been fun fishing and watching other people and how they approach it. And I try to ask questions to understand thought processes. That's kind of my, that's how I like to learn, I, I guess. Um, and doing the captain's round table has been really an awesome experience because I get to meet a lot of, you know, established, well, you know, very good fishermen, tournament fishermen, uh, charter guys, and uh, and kind of understand a little bit what they think and, and how they approach things. But then to hear them say things like, um, you know, direction and speed, and that's really a critical, the most critical thing. You know, we did a lot of talking about that, and I, I think a lot of people are on that same page with that. So it's kind of neat to see different thoughts. You know, I'd like to get to Wisconsin and, and hopefully do a cabin's round table over there and uh, maybe a couple of them and, and uh, kind of understand that fishery a little bit better and uh, understand the approach a little bit better. I know, you know, you guys have fish different times of the year th- than we do really. It seems um, maybe with these uh, upcoming plant uh, numbers being increased, which we've been promised, uh, hopefully you know that'll improve the fishing everywhere to to kind of have resident fish or at least um you know fish following the bait you know kind of rare to see bait and no fish in the bait but we have been seeing that for a decade or so so let's let's talk about that for a second because you actually brought me to a point that i wanted to discuss with you so i'm glad you did which is the stocking um let's talk for just a second about the current situation and then let's talk about you know kind of what we're both hearing and like you said being promised uh what's coming but let's start with the current situation i personally thought last year was the best king fishing 
I have seen in maybe close to a decade. Just overall, again, I fished, um, you know, Sheboygan, Sturgeon Bay, Manitowoc, Two Rivers, Port Washington, Milwaukee, Ludington, Manistee, uh, Bay Harbor, uh, uh, Frankfurt, excuse me. Um, trying to think where else. I think there was even some others. But, you know, I fished quite a bit of Lake Michigan. And I just thought from an overall, uh, you know, spectrum, king salmon fishing was probably the best I've seen in maybe 10 years. What, what was your thoughts? I know you had some great fishing. I saw some yeah. great reports and videos. Um, you know, we had... I a hundred percent agree. Um, the last time we've had fishing like this was 2012. Um, in Ludington, we don't generally see King salmon until um, Memorial weekend or a little bit before, but not much. And then they tend to disappear and we have a June lake trout fishery. That's very good. Um, and then the salmon return usually right about the week of the Ludington offshore, um, or a couple days after. It seems to be more of that case, but um, this year we really had excellent salmon fishing from the middle of May all the way. I mean, you know, the last the last trip I went out, um, we caught thirty eight fish and probably hooked seventy, and you know, just a few hours, and uh, it, just phenomenal fishing. And th and those are immature kings and cohos, mature cohos, immature cohos. We had a lot of pink salmon around this year, which we haven't seen. The one thing I will say in 2012, all the salmon were 15 to 17 pounds, every one of them. And, uh, you know, this year we didn't have the same numbers. I don't think we had the quantity, but the, the size of the fish, you know, they were all over 20 pounds. I mean, you didn't even really look at a fish and consider it large until the, it was in the upper 20s. And I've never, I don't know that I've ever seen that in my, my uh, lifetime of fishing. Um, as far as, uh, the bait situation, you know, <laughs> we have better and better electronics and we have the best electronics now than we've ever had on boats. And I think, you know, I'm running pan optics and, um, Garmin just, you know, down imaging, um, brand, you know, all the, the newer electronic stuff and the amount of bait is unbelievable and um you know like here on so people criticize the michigan dnr and, and i get it but we didn't we didn't have a collapse and lake huron collapsed and, and didn't have fish for two decades and that did not happen here and um so you know were they overly cautious in hindsight yes um they would probably admit that too but it didn't crash and if that crash would have happened, the recovery would have been terrible. So, you know, we went through probably a decade of pretty tough fishing. In Ludington, we have pretty tremendous natural reproduction, probably the highest in Lake Michigan um, with the Manistee Rivers and, and uh, the Pierre Marquette River and, and then the Betsy to the north. Um, you know, we have, a, we have a lot of salmon. We, we have a lot of return here. Um, we don't actually plant. We haven't planted salmon in Ludington and. Uh, king salmon we haven't planted in, I would say, probably eight years. Um, you know, we've been planting cohos. We have a really good coho fishery in Ludington now that we never had uh, in the past. And that's good to see, too. And then, you know, I, I don't know that people are really aware of the descent decree that exists. And, um, you know, so last year, I really think they could have planted more fish. I, I know they wanted to, but there is a an agreement that Michigan the federal government, the state of Michigan, um, and the, I think five, uh, Michigan tribes, they have this agreement, um, to share the fishery. And it's basically a 50, 50 share. And they are renegotiating that right now. And the negotiations have been, um, very broken up. I think COVID, you know, the, the kind of put a, it should have been completed in 2020. Everybody knows what happened in 2020. And so it's been a very delicate uh, negotiation. And it it's, you know, still not completed. We still don't know what's going to happen. Um, there's a lot of information about this. Um, the Michigan Coalition of uh, Anglers, they have a ton of great information. I'll, I'll try to send you a link and maybe you can post it. 
if people want to see and understand um, the, the the descent decree. And and I'm 100 percent for everybody, you know, being uh, having their part of the fishery and all of that. And I, I totally get it. And I really hope that this comes to um, to an end or to an agreement that everybody can can be happy with. And, and then we can kind of move on with uh, plan, you know, part two of our recovery of, of the bait fish. So the bait fish has recovered. It's time to start planting more fish. And I, and I think the lake as a whole would be helped, you know, uh, by planting more fish. I don't think there's enough. I think there's, there's more bait than there is um, fish. We had some massive die offs. I don't know if you had that on your side of bait fish, but this, um, when the water starts to set up and you have those massive flips of temperature, uh, the bait fish dies and it's a normal thing. It's not, you know, it's not like something to be super concerned about. I don't think um, that, you know, the fish can't tolerate large temperature changes. It's not that they don't have food or anything like that, but we saw those and that, you know, tells you the quantity of bait that does exist. And, and uh, I think that we're in, we're in a good place um, to continue, uh, continue plants and continue. I mean, this is like, you know, Dr. Tanner had a, an idea to basically treat the lake like an aquarium and start putting stuff in there and seeing, you know, what will eat what, and you know, what's the balance and nobody really knows. And there's a lot of science and science is, is something that you learn and change and, you know, the ideas of what you thought, maybe you get, you know, more factual evidence and you can change your ideas, which is, which is acceptable in science. And, it, it, but you should follow the science if you're going to, and there's a lot of let's, politics Let's touch involved. on a couple let- Let's touch on a couple things that you brought up. So sure. one, the bait fish die off is really important. And you're right. People don't realize that that's actually what started this whole thing. Um, mm-hmm. And I would say, you know, for your information, I would say that the Wisconsin side actually sees a larger die off. And I think at this time, Wisconsin holds a larger number or amount of bait fish per season than Michigan does. And I think that's purely just because we have a lot more color in our water. Um, and a lot more nutrients for the bait fish to eat. It's also the reverse why we don't have very much natural reproduction and you guys do. Uh, but with mm-hmm. all that said, what people don't realize is what got Dr. Tanner, as you said, getting this started was that, you know, these cities around the Lake Michigan were having to bulldoze dead alewives off the beaches, you know, in the 60s and 70s because they were becoming such a nuisance and they stink and yada, yada, yada. Um, when they have this annual die off. Well, yeah, we're, we're seeing some of the largest I've seen probably in my lifetime, which is going back to the early, you know, early eighties, um, of die off again. So I'm, I agree. We're in a position where, where we need some more fish in the lake. Uh, Wisconsin kind of got a jump start on that, which is great. And I think it was the right move. And I, and I don't necessarily blame Michigan for being a little more, um, reluctant just because you guys have that natural reproduction helping you on that side. On our side, the Wisconsin side, um, you know, our DNR has been a little bit more aggressive. We've, we're on, I think, going to be our third or fourth year this year of uh, increase already. Um, and I think they're looking to increase it some more. So with the help of the Michigan DNR now doing a, a fairly large increase, it's going to definitely add a lot more fish to the lake. But I think the biggest misconception that the average fisherman doesn't understand is something that you sort of brought up before and I've talked about for a few years now, which is, salmon show up in places at different time of year and the reason that is is because obviously water temperature bait all those kinds of things but there isn't salmon necessarily outside your harbor area in large volumes year round so my point of that is is that they move around that's the big thing right just because wisconsin's planting them in sheboygan doesn't mean the sheboygan fishermen are catching all those salmon and i think there's actually a lot of guys that you know don't take it the wrong way. They just don't, they don't understand that. They don't understand the lake. They, they fish a couple times a year. They have fun out there. They enjoy it. That's what it's all about. But when they hear these numbers and they go, well, you know, Ludington planted no Kings, Sheboygan, Wisconsin planted 80,000. I'm going to go to Sheboygan, Wisconsin and fish. That really doesn't have very much to do with it. Um, and a matter of fact, it used to be that that's where the return was. And we're seeing very, very poor returns on our side where you guys are seeing very large returns. Yeah, so about 80% of the fish that we catch um, in Ludington are natural reproduced fish, you know, no no adipose pin clips. Um, So the, you know, and we do catch a lot of clipped fish that um, when the heads are returned come from uh, Wisconsin and they come from Lake Huron 
and a lot of different areas. Um, you know, one thing I will say is that, and I do, so that this tribal, there, there, there's the consent decree waters. Now that starts from the North Pier in Grand Haven and it goes all the way around, I think to Alpena on the Lake Huron side. And then it goes actually even, I think up into, up into Lake Superior. So it's not that Michigan didn't see, I, I just want to stand up for the DNR just a little bit. And I'm, and I'm not like a, you know, I, I think they get a lot of flack. And I don't know if you, you know, you're aware of Jay Wesley. He's a, a biologist here in um, yep. Lake, on, on um, Michigan side, Lake Michigan. Jay, Jay really is, um, he cares about fishing. He cares about the fishery. Um, he cares about the science. And, uh, he, you know, all of these guys are, are in a gag order with this dissent decree. There's during the negotiations um, to be involved in the negotiation in any way, you have to sign a gag order. Um, so that there's no information leaked from the negotiation. So they can't talk about what's going on. But I just want people to be aware of that, you know, for Michigan to for Michigan to plant more salmon has a political effect on that decree. So that's something that, you know, they don't want to if they plant more fish, then it kind of gives ammunition to the other side to say we want more fish because obviously you you know, you're, you're trying to uh, take more of the reef resource. So it, it's, it's a mess. It really is. It's really kind of ridiculous um, that this all exists and it's not based on science. It's really based on politics, but you know, that's the world that we live in. So, uh, but I applaud Wisconsin for um, kind of stepping up and, and, and uh, making the plants and, and, you know, moving forward with, um, with you know the recovery effort of of the the salmon population so to try to boost that population back up um but i do i totally agree with you on the um the you know salmon are migratory fish lake trout really aren't they might they migrate a little bit but you know they're they're not um they're not moving all around the lake uh during the course of the summer where salmon really, I mean, you can follow it. You can, it's kind of neat with Facebook and Instagram because you can watch, you know, in on the Michigan side, you'll see like South Haven, they're getting fish in South Haven, getting fish in South Haven. Then you'll see Holland, they'll start getting fish there and then Grand Haven. And those are those fish just moving uh, to the north as the water warms up and you, you start to get the thermocline to set up um, where you have that hard separation of cold water with warm water on top. Now up here in Ludington, we don't even really see a thermal climb until it's always after the 4th of July before we see that. And really the warmest water that time of year is on the Wisconsin side. And I think that's why you hold bait fish um, that time of year, especially. Um, and then you do have like green water. We don't, this, this green water phenomenon that we really don't get it here uh, uh, in Ludington and, and a little bit in Manistee, they get it sort of, but it's nothing like southern michigan has or um wisconsin and, and chicago and you know the the bottom parts of uh illinois and wisconsin and indiana we just don't have that water it doesn't it doesn't really exist and and there's not you know it's everything here is sand it's basically underwater sand dunes there's not a, there's a little bit of clay here and there there's almost zero rock um you can bounce a cannonball on the bottom for 20 miles and never snag anything i mean it's sand um and that, and that affects it, but we do have these cold, cold um, rivers, uh, natural, re you know, that, that have a lot of gravel in the top ends of the rivers. And, and um, we have tons of natural reproduction from that. Uh, we really have the right climate um, in or we, we have the right types of rivers to see good natural reproduction. So that's kind of a blessing for us. And it's really has. Um, kind of maintained our fishery for the last decade with all the cuts in, in plants. Now, I have been promised that this year we will, in Ludington, we will see 100,000 uh, king salmon. They plant those in the Sobble, uh, which is at the uh, Ludington State Park, which is a dammed river. Um, the Hamlin, Hamlin Lake is a lake uh, that was created by the Sobble Dam. And so those fish can't 
you know, continue up the river. The, the river's only a couple miles long right there before the dam. And uh, they plant those fish there, and they also plant cohos there. So there should be like 100, and, I think 140,000 fish going in next year. We net pen those fish um, in in the in the Sabo River there, just down from the dam. And uh, the Charter Boat Association here does that, which is a really cool thing. I know they do it all over the place on the Michigan side, and I, and I assume Wisconsin side as well with the net pen projects. So it's really a neat a neat deal. Um, but hopefully, you know this. We'll continue to see um, improvements in the fishery and, and really, and in, uh, I, I don't know that we need to go out and catch more fish per trip. I mean, I speak, I, I fish every day. I understand that like you're in a small boat, you run six rods, you get two or three fish, you're super happy. You know, I mean, I'm fishing every, every day from basically June um, into the middle of September and you know, we, we have good numbers of fish, you know, I think if you can get 20 plus bites on a trip, um, especially if majority of them are silver bites, I, I think that's, that's a good quantity, but I'd like to see the, you know, the, the fishing be good from Holland all the way to Frankfurt. And at the same time, good on the Wisconsin side. And some of that's water temperature driven, but I think if there's more fish in the lake, you'll see, you're going to see better, um, you know, better return or better uh, dispersion of the fish a little bit. Not all be in one, well, like you, you said, know, one core area. Right. Like you said, because you didn't fish a lot when you were young, I can tell you that, you know, in the late eighties and early nineties into the mid nineties, when I, you know, would start charter fishing as a young guy, we had, you know, good salmon fishing basically from middle of June all the way through September. And now, you know, here in in Wisconsin, now this year was a different year. You know, this year mm-hmm. was definitely uh, more like the old days. But now it's, uh, you know, right around, you know, the Salmon Cup tournament that we host here in Sheboygan, which is the first weekend in June, usually first to second weekend in June. Right around then is when it kind of starts uh, for Kings. And it usually dies about mid-July, you know, sometime in between uh, the 4th of July and the end of July, we'll get a big northeast wind. You guys will get some cold yeah, water on your side. We, you know, we'll get pile drive to our water, and the fish will move over there, and we don't see them again. Um, and that just purely has to do with the fact that there just isn't, quote, unquote, whatever you want to call it, a lot of salmon in the lake, you know, for the amount of area and fishermen and, and yeah, and stuff like that. Where in the, you know, in the 90s, late, late 80s, early 90s, mid-90s, you know, there, it, there was a lot more fish in the lake. So, you know, you'd still have a good number of fish around, you know, kings around, even though maybe a big mass of them would head over to the Michigan mm-hmm. side, we'd still have some around. And, and that's what I saw this year. Uh, we had the best August king fishing we've had in minimum 15 plus years. Uh, even going, even I would say it was even better than 2012 for us in August um, for nice adult salmon. Uh I want to go back one second and then we're going to get into some, a little more fishing um, as we're already closing in on half our time here. But one thing you said earlier that I just wanted to, to speak on, because I think it was a really good comment was in 2012, when our fishing was so good, pretty much all you were catching was adult Kings. Like you said, 15 to 17 pounds was their size, but that's about all you were catching. What mm-hmm. I was super excited about this year was this year was the first year in a long time we caught a lot of size range, meaning all the way from what we call a shaker. I think you might, you guys might call them a skip, whatever the case may be. Um, you know, basically a, a one year old immature, you know, one pound fish all the way, obviously to 30 pounds. But the key is everything in between four pounders, mm-hmm. six pounders, 10 pounders, nine pounders, two year olds, three year olds, four year olds. Um, that is really, really encouraging. I know just from following you and fishing over there a little bit, you saw the same thing. Um, but obviously, you know, talk about that for just a second, and then I'm going to ask you a few questions on fishing. Yeah, so uh, this year, you know, we we, we really saw uh, just incredible fishing, uh, incredible year classes of fish. Um, bait as well. Um, small bait, large bait, magnum size bait. I mean, nine-inch L-wise that I haven't seen in years. Um, but we, um, we had great king fishing, um, mature fish were in the 20 plus pound range. Um, you know, we had a, a lot of like three-year-old kings, as I would call them next year's matures. Um, and they would, you know, they were all in that 10 to 15 pound range, a ton of fish there. 
um, we had like shakers or, or we call them dinks over here. Uh, but, uh, they were huge. They were 20 inch fish. They weren't, uh, you know, 14 inches, 15 inches. They're really, really good size fish. They have a lot of mass to them. I don't know if you noticed this year with your, your mature, uh, salmon, were they shorter than what you had seen in the past? Because we had very few fish over 40 inches, a ton of like 37 to 40 inch fish where um, normally, and they're big, you know, they're 28 pounds in that, in that range where normally, you know, over here, we're seeing 40 to 45 inch fish. And those are, you know, the ones that are breaking into the 30 pound range. We just didn't see them. So I don't know. I don't, it's a, it'd be a good question for, for maybe some biologists to ask is, you know, if they had one year where they kind of struggled with bait, could they be shorter because of one year of stunted growth? Or, you know, if they could see that in a scale sample or something like that. But anyways, that's a whole nother conspiracy theory, maybe that we're talking about over here, but we did have um, great coho fishing, uh, unbelievable steelhead fishing, like uh, a, t a ton of steelhead were caught over here over 15 pounds, which is a tremendous steelhead for, for this side, especially. Um, <clears throat> and then we, like I said, we did have um, great coho fishing, which we've had for six, seven years now. And then uh, we had pink salmon for probably, um, I don't know, probably three or four weeks. We had solid pink salmon fishing where you catch you know, one or two every trip, which is really odd. I think I've only, before this year, probably only caught eight or nine pinks ever and uh, down in, in you know, Ludington area. So we did see that as well. So I don't know, you know, if that has something to do with the quantity of bait or the way the water was set up or what pushed those fish here. But, um, and then we did see some pinks in the um, Pier Marquette River this year, uh, making the run with the Kings. So that was kind of neat to see too. Yeah, well, we definitely had more pinks than I've ever seen in my lifetime this year as well. Um, the only theory I got in on it is that I think those are Lake Huron fish that, you know, have migrated their way over, probably naturally reproduced and have created a population because according to both the Wisconsin and Michigan DNRs, they're not planted. So those fish yeah. are coming from somewhere. Um, and obviously that could be the place. So let's talk a little bit about my favorite place to fish in the entire lake, which is Big Point Sabo. It's obviously ah. a place that you... <laughs> um that you make a living at um i'm a little jealous i have to admit mm -hmm. uh i do think for a plethora of reasons um it is the coolest place on lake michigan to fish and that's why i say it literally uh ludington is my favorite port to fish out of because my second favorite place to fish would probably be little point um so if i had oh, to yeah. pick two places those would probably probably be the two places but let's talk a little bit about big point sabo just give us like a Give us like a three, four minute, nothing too crazy, but a three, four minute rundown of you're heading out in the morning on a July charter. Uh, you know, you're heading to Big Point Sabo in the dark. You're going to set up. Kind of tell us like what you're looking to do, where where you're generally going to set up. Not, you know, super specific, but I'm going to set up on the inside and work my way out or outside, work my way in. Um, you know, I'm looking to get into the line of traffic. And then, you know, what's your normal set? Meaning like, you know, sure. I'm going to run a couple of meat rigs. I'm going to run a couple of flashers, whatever that may be. So, um, so we call it, we call it the bank up there and kind of the consensus with local fishermen anyways, is that, um, when you go to the run up to the bank, there's a shelf at about 80 foot, um, where it's fairly flat. And then on top, it goes up to about 60 and there's, there's fishable space there. And then there's literally a drop off that is if you have if you're running panoptics, you can actually see the bottom like this on your panoptics because it's that steep of a drop off. And in the matter of a hundred yards, it goes from ninety feet to one hundred and thirty feet. So there's the everybody's fighting for these little slivers of water. And the thought process is that if you pick a depth, if you pick one hundred and ten foot, you go down the bank in one hundred and ten foot, and you don't change depth. So by by staying in the same depth of water, you're considered going straight. Now, um, you know, and the reasoning behind it is if you set up an 80 foot and you decide that you want to go out, you're, you, you push, there's so many boats. I mean, there'll be, 
two or 300 boats working Big Point Sable, all in the same depth contour between 160 foot and 80 foot. And everybody works together and tries to drive straight, which is a, about a 30 degree Northeast troll. Um, and it'll change a little bit, but but that's kind of what everybody's trying to maintain. Um, and so my approach, I generally like to be just off. Um, so I would say like in that 110 to 130 foot range, that's kind of my comfort zone. Um, it's really hard if you're on a charter, it's really hard to set up in the 60 to 80 foot because you can't get out to deep water until you get past the point. So you're going to, so if the water's too warm in there, um, then you're going to be riding in warm water until you get past the bank or uh, past big point Sabo, which is, you know, probably about four miles that you're going to be riding in there and kind of water. That's not probably not going to produce a lot of fish. So safety wise, I like to set up a little, a little bit deeper. Now, if I'm tournament fishing, throw it out the window, I'm going to go up in there and try and catch a big fish. Usually the biggest fish are up in there where the, the most bait is. Um, so that's kind of the, my, my approach. Now, let's just say average day, July, I'm going to head down um the bank now july for us is like early king fishing so we're not fishing a lot of plugs or anything but i would be pretty uh commonly almost always have a 11 inch paddle uh no fin paddle so like a dream weaver paddle or uh you know coyote style pa paddle down the chute that'll be kind of mirroring the bottom maybe uh 20 feet below the thermal or something like that or you know it's going to be just above the bottom um and then my divers in the last few years of my divers, I've been running spoons on them. And uh, if I was tournament fishing, I, I think I would run more rotators. But um, the spoons are much faster to reel fish in on than a rotator fly or a rotator meat rig. So um, a lot of times I'll have spoons on all my divers or I'll spoons on three divers with a rotator on one, with normally with a fly. And then I usually run four boards on each side. And most of those would have spoons to start out and then I would transition the deeper coppers to, um, to meat rigs as the morning went on. Um, I like, you, you know, I do like to run meat. Uh, this last year I didn't, I didn't see a huge success on, on meat rigs over just fly. Um, and I, I found that I fished a lot more small paddles with fins on them. Um, the pro trolls, the salmon candies, um, you know, Dreamweaver has their their new uh, flip fin uh, paddle, but and I think maybe that's why I, I'm going a little bit, maybe a little bit faster. So I'm running more spoons. I'm running those those finned, um, you know, Oki style, Oki tackle or Opti tackle, excuse me, uh, style rotators. Um, but really saw great success with them and with meat rigs buying them too. Um, so that was kind of my, that's kind of my main go to. Uh, I would say, you know, lots of spoons on the out and downs are almost always have a spoon with a, a slider above it. Um, it, it. Lots of, you know, moonshine, dreamweaver, yak, uh, a little bit of Sam candy. Actually, Jason uh, from Early Bird, um, he gave me uh, a couple of Sam candy spoons and I started running them and, and trying them out and, and uh, had pretty good success on those, too. So I was I was pretty impressed with them. Um, and they hold up pretty well too, surprisingly, for a thin spoon that has quite a bit of flex. But uh, anyways, uh, you know that's kind of my main thing. Uh, very spoon heavy in my approach, so lo lots of uh, generally moonshine spoons. So it's interesting to me because um, people don't really understand unless you maybe sit in a position like I do or you do, or maybe some other people who can take a large view of the entire lake. And then even for me, I'm blessed enough that I have a lot of relationships on Lake Ontario. So I can take even like a large view on the Great Lakes. And it's, it's interesting to me how the individuals who share information, have YouTube pages, yada, yada, stuff like that. Um, they sort of, that's what I'm looking for. They sort of develop, I guess, or mold. That's what I'm looking for. They sort of mold the fishermen and the way people fish in that general area. And and what I'm getting at with that is the Michigan side has always been much more spoon heavy than the Wisconsin side, or at least has been since rotators have come into play in the early 2000s. And I think that really honestly has a lot to do with me 
I've always been a diehard flash or fly fisherman. So I've really promoted and pumped that flash or fly program hard uh, throughout the years, whether it was a pro troll, a salmon candy, a stinger flasher, uh, you know, even spin doctors at times with meat rigs or flies. But um, where on the Michigan side, it's heavy, heavy spoons. And I think that that just has a lot to do with maybe speed. Um, you guys like to go a lot quicker than I do. Um, it also has a lot to do with, you know, the time of year, the multi-species fishing, you know, a whole bunch of different things that work there. But I always related the Michigan side, you know, quite a bit more towards Lake Ontario because they also fish a lot more spoons than, you know, we do here in Wisconsin. So I was not surprised at all uh, by your, you know, <laughs> sort of your average spread and, and what you, um, you know, what you take. But now I want to ask you a spoon question because you appear you know, obviously to really, really like spoons. So if you're going to fish for bigger salmon, I, you know, let's say it's a tournament time and you want to put some spoons in your mix um, for a tournament morning, are you going to lean heavy towards magnums for big kings or are you going to keep some standards in there because you got a lot of confidence in standards even for big kings? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. Um, I, th- there's a couple of things that come, I think come into play and speed is the one that's probably the biggest. Um, I tend to, when I'm focusing on larger kings, I like to go slow. Um, I especially like to go slow if I find a pot of large kings. I want to spend as much time um, above those kings as I possibly can. I think that you'll find oftentimes that large fish will school together, um, at least over here. Uh, The other thing I think with the spoons here is that um, we have a lot of current. We have a lot more current than I think most people are used to fishing in. And I think the spoons are a little bit more forgiving um, with the current Uh, speed, you know, a little bit more speed tolerant maybe. And sometimes it's really hard to go exceptionally slow um, if you're, especially if you're going into the current and the current pretty much always follows the bank. So you're, if you're going to the north, the current's running to the south, you're going to deal with that all day long. Um, but the, as far as um, the mag regular size, I, I find that um, I, I do run a lot of mags. Um, I like to run mags, especially on divers. Um, but I, I feel I catch just as many fish on an SS size spoon. Um, as I do on uh, of uh, mature fish on a SS as I do on a on a uh, mag. I do find that myself, I I tend uh, fish if I'm fishing above the thermal. So I'll say I have a seven color, the, the thermal's at fifty feet. I'm running a seven color. It's probably going to have a regular size spoon on it. I don't. I always seem to run the warm side small spoons and the deep side large spoon. I don't know why I do it, but I'm pretty consistent in doing it. So I would say that I, my um, my data would be very skewed because it's not like I run a lot of small spoons deep. So I, I don't know if there's a correlation there, but that's kind of my approach. Um, but well, you're, you're 100% on the same program as I am then and been promoting for years, which is I say my size of bait generally speaking for me, has nothing to do with the size of the fish, has to do with the depth of water I'm trying to fish it in. So I like to fish my mini spoons up in that top 20, uh, 20, 15 feet of water column. I don't care if it's for kings, browns, steelhead, whatever. You know, that 15 to 70 range or so, 60 range or so is my standard spoon wheelhouse. And if I'm going to put spoons out down below 60, 70 feet, it's going to be a magnum spoon. So you and I are definitely on, on the same page there. Um, and I find that interesting because I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions for a weekend guy, especially if he's getting into his first derby, you know, maybe the Samarama, or he's going to fish the local, you know, Captain Chuck's big fish competition or whatever. He assumes because he's trying to fish for big fish, he's got to have a 12 inch fish blade with a meat rig out there and he must have mags or super mag spoons only. And that's just definitely not the case. Uh, them, the yep. big fish eat small baits all the time. Uh, it's just a matter of where they are in the water column and what you feel comfortable with um, and what works for you. Now, on the other hand, I have to say I'm, I'm interested in the diver convert com- comment just because uh, it, that's the polar opposite of me. I think I've ran a spoon on my wire divers less than three times in my life. It's something that <laughs> in my life, it's something that I just basically never do. Um, there's always a paddle on there. 
Uh, it's like an omen for me. So um, that is interesting. It obviously works. It's just yeah. something that I'm just not comfortable or confident at all doing. Well, I'll give you the background on it. So I never did it ever in my life. Uh, I never would run spoons on divers. If I ran a spoon on a diver, it would be on a slide diver. That's the only way I ever approached that. And I started to fish for fin power charters. They were the first company that I worked for at, when I got my captain's license. And I was running by myself and I was running meat rigs and I was running rotator flies and and long leads and all of the stuff. And, and some of the other captains were very seasoned captains, uh, Dennis Plamondon uh, from Clocked Out. He worked for um, Richard at the time, Richard Loxenden from Finn Power as well. Uh, and I, you know, I would ask them, well, what are you running on your dive? What are you running on your high diver? And they would say, you know, I'm running a mag uh, Wonder Bread spoon. And I'm like, really? You run a mag spoon? They're like, yeah, because it's much easier when you're by yourself with customers that don't you know, aren't necessarily aware of all of the things going on. It's much easier to run spoons on your divers than it is to run rotators. And, and it's very true. It's very, it's much easier to net a fish on a spoon. It's much easier to control a fish on a spoon. Um, it, you know, if you have to hand line, you're not fighting that, um, that rotator. So I think that that's where it came from. Um, and I started to run more and more spoons on my divers to the point where just in the last couple of years, I've, there's been days where I've gone out and I have no rotators. Everything has a spoon when I start in the morning, which is very, if, if you looked at my program 10 years ago, it's like polar opposites. I never would have done it. I would have told you that I didn't think it would work and I'm doing it now. So I, I think that, you know, that kind of says something as far as, uh, it sometimes, um, you know, you get set in your ways or you get set in what you're comfortable with or what you have confidence in and you continue to do it. And I think that's good. I think you should um, have confidence in the baits that you have in the water and the um, confidence in the way that you are, you know, running those baits, whether there be coppers or cores or, lead, you know, uh, wire divers, whatever it is. Um, it, it, if you have a lot of confidence in the base that you have in the water, I think then you start to look at other elements of um, trolling that could possibly be not getting you bit. Instead of changing a bait, maybe you change your angle of troll or instead of changing um, a spoons on your out and down, maybe you turn uh, or you uh, speed up or you slow down or something like that. So I think there's, you know, but there again, there's lots of ways to do it. I could be going down the bank running all spoons and you're right next to me going down the bank running all rotators and we're both catching fish at the same time. So, um, but it's probably going to be, I'm probably going to be go, going faster than you are going. But, um, you know, that's not even necessarily always true. But I will say that when I start in the morning, I almost always have my, pa I, the paddle's my confidence. The paddle's my, um, my rattling horns and whitetail, you know, I'm going to, that's kind of what brings fish to me is that flash and that that kind of constant big flash and i i think that that rotator doesn't always necessarily catch the fish but i think it brings the fish to the other baits that catch the fish so i think that's important to have a rotator in your program it's very it's very odd that i don't have one on the shoot i almost always just i just always run a shoot rotator and it's usually my deepest rod um at the same point but um as far as bait sizes in the morning, if we caught all the fish on mag spoons the night before, I still am going to have a mixture of spoons and I, and I'm going to let the fish tell me what they want. You know, I'm not going to go out there and run a huge mag program. And then, um, you know, my buddies, you know, two boats next to me and he's running all, you know, stinger, size spoons or SS size spoons and he's catching fish on those. Um, like I'll, I'll have like a mixture. I might only have one or two regulars or one or two, you know, small spoons or, you know, the same with mags, but I'm always going to have a combination. And as I make my first pass, if all of our bites are coming on regular spoons, we will start changing everything to regular spoon. And, um, 
you know, I'm not a huge guy about color as much as I am about contrast. And that's what I like about uh, a lot of your um, salmon candy um, rotators is that I like the way that you mix um, UV tapes, slick tape, crush tape, um, you know, things that glow, things that don't glow. And I think that you, you create a lot of contrast in the visual. So, um, you know, something's half glow, half not glow as that thing rotates, it's going to flash a certain way. And I think that's overlooked. I think more people should pay more attention to contrast than you do to uh, to color and size. Just pay attention to how that thing, think about how that's going to look from 30 feet away when it's flipping and rolling in the water. So that's Let me ask you the number uh, one. The number one flasher Wisconsin to Michigan question, and I like to ask every Michigan guy this. Okay. Why do spin doctors work better in Michigan than they do in Wisconsin? Do you have a theory? I don't know. No, you haven't fished with you haven't fished Wisconsin, but obviously no. um to give you sort to give you sort of an out, outlier, if you come to Wisconsin, you will probably be able to count on two hands you know, the amount of spin doctors on rods in most ports up and down the entire lakeshore, like on all the boats in all the port and in, in the port all together, you'd be able to count on probably two hands, how many spin doctors. Um, and it's not because they're not available. They are. Um, yeah. But yet you go to Michigan and it, and it flips almost entirely. Why do you think that is? It, it doesn't make sense. Um, my, my only thought is that the current i think that an eight inch spin doctor is very forgiving with speed and and i think um especially like when it's getting hit with a current from the side or something like that maybe it's the profile of the bait i'm not really sure you know like the big back holds um you know when you're in heavy current situations they don't fish very well for me anyways um i tend to tend to get them, you know, tangling and, and that sort of thing. Um, I don't know if that, the only, I mean, other than that, what could the difference really be? You know, the fish are the same fish. It, it's in the, and everyone's trolling in similar manners. It's not like, you know, you guys are constantly turning to the right or something while you're trolling. I mean, it, it has to be something like that. That's, that's a, my only take that I think I can come up with on it. Really not sure, well, but I'll you know, you, I've, I'll give you my theory. I've, I'll give you my theory and let okay. you kind of d- decide if you think it's, it, it's, you know, worth it or not, but I believe it's water temperature based. And I think the thing has been that whatever way the spin doctor rolls, it tends to work better when the water gets warm. So the times that we actually do see good success using the spin doctors here on the Wisconsin side is after the 4th of July. The problem is we've had, very little to no salmon after the 4th of July here in Wisconsin Mm -hmm. the last how many years. Now, the flip side of that is you guys generally get your salmon after the 4th of July when the water warms up and your spin doctors work really, really well. And the reason that I actually say this, and I believe this wholeheartedly, is I come to the Michigan side, you have to have them on your rods. Like, I'm the first to admit, Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, I've never worked for Dreamweaver. I've never been a pro staffer for Dreamweaver. None of those things... Um, whatsoever, but I like Shane. He makes good stuff. Um, I come to Michigan. I have to play the game. I have to have a couple spin doctors on the rods this year in particular. I actually didn't do super well on them. We did okay on the black slick and the white slick, you know, the ones you gotta have. Um, and we caught some fish on them, but they weren't great. Uh, matter of fact, Megatron and a few of our others, Mountain Dew stud out produced them, um, while we were there, but you gotta have them on the rods. You cut, you, I go back home. You know, when I used to do the tournament thing, like a lot, like I'd go to Michigan for a week, come home for a week, go back to Michigan for a week. I'd come home and I'd, I'd run the town with spin doctors on every rod. And I mean, I was like, okay, I'm going to crush them, you know, just like the Michigan side. <laughs> nothing, nothing. And it's like, yeah. so um, that's my theory. And I think that's really uh, what, what happens. And, and here's what's really interesting. Again, I mentioned to you before, you get to see things from a big picture, right? Lake Ontario is very split. Um, part of Lake Ontario really, really uses a lot of spin doctors. Part of Lake Ontario uses a lot of paddles, which, you know, what I call uh, a salmon candy flasher, a stinger flasher, a moonshine flasher, whatever, a paddle style flasher. Um, again, I think it's oriented there in the same way. One part of the lake gets really, really warm. 
One part of the lake stays mm-hmm. more cold. The part of the lake that stays more cold seems to be really, really linked to that salmon candy, uh, pro troll, um, you know, stinger flasher and the, the side or the end of the lake that gets warm fast and stays warm seems to really be linked to the spin doctor. So something for you to put in your thoughts, something to think about. But as you venture outside Ludington more and maybe even into Wisconsin, uh, with some of your, some of your stuff, I'd be very interested to see your take as you play with that. Yeah, and I I like that. I like that theory. That that makes that does make a lot of sense. Um, you know, the the other thing like up here is like southern Michigan, they use a, a lot of stingers, a lot of stinger spoons. And I fished down there and you know, um last year I fished a lot down there with innuendo and we'll continue to do that this year. And um they use a lot of stingers. They have a lot of success. And I come off a weekend in Holland with all these stinger spoons. You know, I stop at, or, or you know, St. Joe's Salt Haven. I stop at Tackle Haven, bought a whole bunch of stingers, brought them home, and couldn't catch anything on them. And it's a, kind of the same thing. But their water temperature is obviously um, much warmer uh, that time of year than, than it would <clears throat> when I came home. So so it would make sense that that, that temperature has a lot to do with with that um yeah i that's a good i i'll i will pay more attention to that moving forward and see if i can uh come up with a correlation there Uh, you know the the thing for here though too is that if i'm gonna i'm like out fishing and i feel like i need to put a rotator in the water it's gonna be a spin doctor i mean that's what i grab first and i think everybody here that's what they grab first and you know if if you're grabbing a a pro troll first or a, you know, a fin paddle first over the, over the spin doctor, then um, you're probably going to catch more fish on whatever you put out there. Uh, and the, you know, the first bait. <clears throat> so that might, you know, be uh make, might make it more dramatic uh, difference, but I think that that makes sense that it could be definitely water, water temperature driven. So, on that subject, I think that's a great point, but I want to make this note and sort of, because I love having this types of conversation, right, with with somebody else who's experienced and knows what he's talking about and, and has opinions. Um, I would agree with you almost 100% to say that if you put out all spin doctors, you're going to catch fish on spin doctors. But here's the flip side to that. Would you catch more fish on a paddle style flasher? Or like you said before, let's say a stinger spoon versus a moonshine spoon. And here's what mm-hmm. I did at home. So when I had my store, Anglers Avenue, you know, I'll be the first one to admit, I mean, I, and my job was to sell stuff. I wanted to sell tackle. So when I first started fishing the Michigan side and I was catching some fish on spin doctors, I put this huge wall of spin doctors in my store. I wanted to sell those. So I made a, a like a serious attempt to have great success with them and sell them. I went out many, many mornings in a row, probably seven, eight, nine mornings in a row on charter trips or fun fishing trips in the dark when they will bite on whatever, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever the term you want to use, uh, you know, um, they will bite on everything and had very, very limited success, um, with spin doctors. And then there'd be certain occasions where we'd have some Kings around when the water was warm later in the year, yada, yada. And all of a sudden we, we killed them on them. So that's where I kind of come up with that theory. And I think it has a lot more to do with that than it does maybe what's in the water, but you're not wrong. You know, I mean, Dreamweaver is a Ludington-based company. If every single boat in Ludington has six Dreamweaver spin doctors on, there's going to be some fish caught on spin doctors. There's absolutely yeah. no doubt about it. Um, but for the guys that really want to get good at this, you know, if they can fit, like you, like me, um, who want to get to be as good as we possibly can, we need to figure out what works the best when. And that's and why. really, really the key asset yeah. here. And why. If you exactly could, why. So if you let's could talk figure about the whys, the whys would make you – that would give you a huge advantage if you can understand why not even repeating, you know, you, you, you repeat historical things that have worked for you, but if you understood why they historically worked, you know, that it would be amazing. If somebody figures that out, contact me, I will keep it between you and I, <laughs> I'd love to have that. All right. Well, I'm going to ask you, as we wrap up here in the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to ask a couple more quick questions. So keep them, keep them quick if you can, so we can get a couple subjects done. Sure. But um, you guys fish lake trout quite a bit differently than we do. 
Uh, lake trout's not the most overly popular fish on either side of the lake for the average weekend person, but the reality of it is we do have to fish them at time to time. We have to fish them in charters, we have to fish them in tournaments. And quite frankly, if you want to move the rods some weekends, fun fishing, you got to put yeah. some lake trout stuff down. Talk yeah. for two, three minutes only about your lake trout setup, because I know it's quite a bit different than how we fish them here. Yeah. So, um, so like I said before, we have mostly sand bottom. So we actually can drag cannonballs on the bottom of the lake and not have any issues with that. Um, we'll actually wear the coating and put flat spots on our cannonballs from dragging them on the bottom. Um, so that is kind of our, our normal approach. So we have um, usually, you know, you're running two downriggers, both out and downs, and they're bouncing the bottom and they're, they're making contact. And then behind that, you have um, almost always a, a chrome spin doctor of some sort, what, whether it be a trout candy that has, you know, some tape on one side or, or whatever it is, but a chrome spin doctor and then either a, a spinning glow or a whirly gig. Um, are pretty common. We do have zebra mussels on the bottom, so you do want something that'll float up a little bit. That's kind of what I like about um, the spin doctor is the spin doctor floats a little bit. It floats up a little bit. Um, where when I run dodgers, I tend to get dirty more often. Plus with a spin doctor, I control for lake trout at 2.3 on my fish hawk all day long and be super successful and catch salmon while I'm doing it as well. So I, I have a lot more confidence in that. We hardly run any metal anymore. Um, that uh, And even like cowbells, hardly run any cowbells anymore. However, there's some new cowbells that somebody is making <laughs> that have been very successful over here. And um, and I hope to do, uh, you know, more fishing with them um, this year um, with your plastic cowbells. They're just tremendous. Like. Uh, they really work for our fishing, but then, you know, we're running, um, our divers in a similar manner, uh, running them right on the bottom or just off the bottom and running spin doctors on those or, or, um, what, you know, mostly spin doctors, very seldom are we running, um, dodgers, maybe one dodger in the water. So in a, in a nine trout spread, I would say that, you know, eight spin doctors and, and one dodger, eight spin doctors and one set of cowbells, something like that. Um, and then almost all spinning glows and whirly gigs. Uh, very few peanuts anymore. We have too much problem with them getting dirty. Uh, but that's, I mean, that's, that's what we're doing. And we're, you know, cruising along 2.0 to 2.3. And uh, where, you know, 10 years ago, I was running mo – probably 80% uh, metal in the water and we were going one, eight, one, seven, one, six, really slow. And so I, I think that the, the spin doctor kind of for us is um, it, it's allowed us to troll faster. Um, plus, you know, the, the tin cans, when you kept, you kept losing those, you know, they were kind of like when we started to have to really target trout for, uh, for our charters, you know, you didn't want to go out and lose four or five tin cans in a week because you can't get them anymore. So we would, we just started using more and more chrome spin doctors. And then we really started having a lot of success on them and just kind of transitioned all to spin doctors instead of, uh, instead of uh, dodgers. And, you know, we have so, yak lures over here and, uh, you know, uh, Ged is continued yuck lures after Doug's passing and, and, uh, you know, they make a lot of, they still make some Dodgers and that, and that sort of thing. So we do use a little bit of that stuff, but for the most part, it's, it's almost all, uh, plastic rotators that we're using nowadays. So are you using eight inch or 10 inch primarily with the spinning glows on the divers for the <laughs> doctors? So, so, um, so on hiatus, we fish trout. We're really good at, trout fishing deep um we catch a lot of trout uh deeper than 160 feet um i think the deepest there's my cat sorry i think the deepest um oh. the, the deepest we ever caught was um like, like uh 380 feet bouncing bottom and we're using large cannonballs very large cannonballs that are made over here uh, from yuck lures 23 pounders 
and we're fishing in that 150 to 250 foot range and um when we get deeper when i get deeper than about 120 130 feet i switch to 10 inch over the eight but usually if i'm running shallower than 130 foot i'm running smaller cannonballs so they don't contact the bottom as hard and then also eight inch spin doctors so it's really just a depth thing for me and we even use so some it goes really right back big to the same theory we have with spoons yeah go ahead go ahead oh no yeah it's the yeah. same thing with yeah with same spoons. thing we talked about with spoons more flash yeah Exactly. There, okay. Last question. So if sure. you had to give the folks at home a top, let's say top six setups that if they're going to come to Ludington and fish for Kings in that July, August time frame, these are six setups, whether it be a flasher fly, flasher meat, a spoon that they better not leave home without. I'm going to put sure. you on the spot, give it to them. So they make sure they got it for this year. Okay. So um, I, I'll just go off the last couple of years. Uh, I think that it does change often, um, but so I run a lot of um, rotator wise, you know, I'm running an 11 inch paddle uh, has glow, slick glow tape on both sides. Um, Dreamweaver paddle with a pickled sunshine fly. It's always there long lead on the fly. Um, I run an eight inch and 10 inch um, white spin doctor with slick tape on both sides pickle sunshine fly same deal um those are kind of my go-to rotators that i run a ton of um as far as spoons uh the last couple of years the soda spoon um from uh, moonshine and also the slice spoons from moonshine um the orange green and blue slice uh those are uh, dynamite for me um, you know, green jeans for some reason didn't work this year for me, but in the Southern basin it did. So, but, um, I would say like lots of green, uh, glow spoons, uh, regular size and Magnum size. Um, I'm always running, uh, SS wonder breads or super breads. Those are always in the water. Um, bloody nose is another one, um, that's always in the water. And then I'm a big fan of the um, Silver Horde and Captain's Choice plugs, um, mainly Double Glow or variation thereof. Um, but for the most part, it, you know, that's kind of my my standard. Uh, there's not a lot of change in that. You know, I, I run basically SS spoons from Dreamweaver and then Yek spoons. I do run a lot of those. Um, the Jared, the Fireball. Um you know, the uh, warp frog is almost always, I always have one of those around somewhere. Um, so those are probably kind of my, my big go-tos as far as that goes. Uh, I, I'm not a guy that run like I don't run a ton of rotators. I did, uh, run, that Megatron thing was phenomenal for me this year. And that was my, my first real, one of uh, a mate that works with me brought it on the boat and uh, we put it out and you know went like three times the first day the, the first trip that we put it out and then so i started running it pretty regularly in my rotation and you know it, it didn't always get bit but most days it at least took one fish and then um so then i started fishing more of the same kind of ideas and uh some of the dragon slayer stuff and and that and and um you know had some pretty good pretty good but this is all later this is uh when the water's warm, you know, thermal down 70, 80 foot kind of situations. So, but I didn't have them in the, early in the year. So who knows? We'll see next year. I'll have them in my arsenal to play with. Well, you, you did exactly what I thought you'd do. You're like every other tackle junkie like myself. I asked <laughs> you to name six baits and you named 16 baits. So, I mean, that's, uh, that's kind of the, the, the fun part about it. But the important part there is, and I, and I like to, you know, mention is that you know things are different each different place you go people use a little bit different stuff um but the stuff works all over the lake you got to find what works for you um i really appreciate you taking the time today to uh you know to come on and and talk a little bit about fishing how do they find your youtube channel tell them how to find that if they want to check out some of the things that you do yeah absolutely so i am pretty 
uh, regularly on Facebook, uh, Real to Real Outdoors on Facebook, and then also Real to Real Outdoors uh, on YouTube is my YouTube channel. I also have a website, um, which is real to real Um And I do, if you are coming to the Lington area, um, I do two uh, fishing reports a week. Um, generally one right before the weekend and, and one, uh, towards the end, like the beginning of the next week. And if I talk about it, that's what I'm running. I'm not, you know, I have a lot of wonderful sponsors that take uh, great care of me and, um, you know, moonshine and Dreamweaver and yak, uh, they're always, you know, they have my back, they help me out. But if I'm running something and it's working, it's even like, like the Megatron, you know, I don't have any affiliation with with um, Russell and Sammy Candy and, you know, it was producing fish. I'm going to talk about it. So what you will get from me is the truth. So if I'm catching fish on something, I will tell you what I'm catching fish on. I have no problem with that. And I'm not going to tell you I'm catching fish on something I'm not. So um, if you're coming to the area, um, just check, check out those fishing reports and you'll have a pretty good idea of what my program is. Feel free to, you know, reach out to me. I try to answer as many messages and emails as I can. Uh, it gets pretty crazy in the summer. Um, but, you know, I, I love to help other people. I want everyone to catch fish and be successful and, you know, get out there and, and enjoy what I love. So if I can help in any way, uh, I'm always open to uh, to questions and, and, uh, and love to help people. So. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. That was Captain Adam Knutson from Real to Real Outdoors. This is another episode of the Morning Buzz with Russell's Fishing Tech. We will be back again next week with another guest. Not sure who yet, but we'll get it figured out. We'll see you next Sunday. <laughs>